everybody. Hello. 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 Hi, Kate. Hi, everyone. How are you? Hi. Holly, did you uh, did you get the report I sent in? To me. To everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So let's begin. We'll start with the folks who are here. Because the rest of you I know can go get coffee, you can feed your dog, you can leave it. That's the only way. Okay. Should I just leave it here, and if anybody else yeah, comes in, it comes in. Yeah, wave it in their direction. Okay. Okay. So we'll start with. Do we all introduce ourselves? Well, we can. Yeah. Sally Underwood Miller. I'm the chair. I represent the conservation committee. Jay Pike, <coughs> excuse me, Jay Bykovsky from the finance committee. Tom Stokes from the board of assessors. Gary Pitney from the planning board. Patrick White from the select board. Carol Owens, I'm the representative from the select board. Fill the chair on the ground, I'll move out. Okay. And the guests, maybe they can. Yeah, they will introduce themselves as they. India. Begin their process. And we also have Anne, who's. Yeah, and Anne, Anne Rabinowitz is also um, re on remote. All right, you are here first. Would you like to begin? Yeah, uh, so Matthew Boudreau, the chair of the Ag and Forestry Commission. Um, and I'm here uh, seeking to make two propositions. Um, please bear with me, I've never done this before. So uh, let me know what you want to hear. <laughs> but um, we are seeking to uh, ask for funds for uh, Treating uh, ice pine, the hemlocks. Um, we're seeking 80,000 for treatment. Um, we are treating the trees this year, but what we have in funds will only treat half of the trees that are in poor condition. Um, and that being said, uh, since we started this project, already 30 to 50 of the trees have died. Um, so we are uh, seeking to continue treating to make sure that the rest don't. Uh, and then the second proposition, we are looking to produce a sign, uh, signage, uh, that will be for Ice Glen to inform the public of the cultural significance and to uh, explain the processes that we're going through with the treatment. What about trail work? Weren't you also um, looking at some trover? We decided not to okay. make it more complicated. <laughs> so is that included in the 80,000 or not? No, that would be a separate um, proposal. And what would you, what's your estimate on that? Uh, we are currently, fortunately, Shelby's not here. <laughs> he's supposed to come through. He's on, he's um, on. Oh, put it yeah. uh, I, I, um, So this is Shelby Marshall. I'm, I'm on the, the commission as well. Uh, I'm waiting to get quotes, uh, we want to have two interpretive signs, um, the same sign, basically, one at each end of the trail and possibly some small plaques um, along the trail um, that say a little bit about significant trees that are visible from the trail. They may be significant trees that are that have died and say, like, why, why they died, or perhaps not died, um, but they're worth saying something about. Um, I think from from what I remember from um, getting these quotes in the past, it's probably going to be in the order of ten to fifteen thousand dollars total. But um, I'm not sure we're wait, we're going to get the quotes by the end of the week. We'll certainly have them in hand um, in time you know, to to include them in a proposal. For signs, fifteen thousand well, dollars. Well, these are these are um, like. Have you been up to um, Laurel Hill Park since the um, since Lowell Hill Day last past summer? No, I have not. Ah, okay. So, I mean, these are signs like um, like on the Houstonic River Walk. Uh, they're, they're, you know, 15 inches or so deep, about three or four um, feet wide um, metal framing 
uh, you know, really solid anchored into the ground. Um, so you tell the you know, interpretive signs with, with information about uh, you know, the, the, the history, geology, some photos, uh, and the, the ecology and the significance of the old growth forest. You know, as well as, of course, what we're doing to, to try to save it. Okay, Sally, I'm a little lost. The signs are 15,000 each. No. The 15, the 15. That's 15,000 for both. My, that's, that's what I expect, somewhere between 10 and 15,000 for the, altogether for the signs. Mm -hmm. Two signs. Okay. And uh, so in terms of uh, the treatment for the uh, sick ash trees, you say uh, 30 have died. That's out of how many do you? So uh, when we did the survey uh, last year, we found that 226 of the trees were in poor condition. Um, 100. Oh, I just want to jump in. Um, Tom, it is that we're talking about the hemlocks, not the ash right now. Hemlocks, correct. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. So it goes the woolly adelgid. The woolly adelgid and uh, the elongated scale. They actually have two uh, invasives on them. Uh, 226 of them were in poor condition. 123 were in fair condition. And we could only find one that was in quote unquote good condition. Um, so we're waiting till we can get back. We only can tell when we really get back into the spring. But the expert that we've been working with says that he thinks probably 30 or 50 have perished since he started observing them. Is that Ken Gooch? What is that? Is that Ken yes. Gooch? Yes. Yeah. So um, I've been uh, observing very closely uh, another hemlock stand in, in Stockbridge and Lennox which is uh, at Sh along Shadow Brook, and it happens to be land that used to be in my family, now owned by BNRC. And we had expected the hemlocks to be dead by now, but actually they're doing better now than they did 10 years ago. They seem to have built a resistance to the woolly adelgid, and they've adapted to it. And uh, so, um, and there's been no treatment at all of those trees. And I'm wondering if you've had a look at those trees and if you feel that herbicides are really essential to save these trees. Um, to, to talk to that point, um, I think the problem is the line for the woolly adelgid has moved north. Um, we used to have strong winters that could kill the woolly adelgid. Uh, but now that line, since 10 years ago even, has moved farther north that they're surviving at higher rates um, than they used to be. Um, this treatment that we are talking about is really a triage. It is to preserve them for a couple more years so that they can reproduce, get the succession of hemlocks going, and hopefully in that time, give the trees a chance to survive. Um, once we get past this period, um, we would be able to use different techniques and different um, systems that would be more systematic for the trees and give them a longer protection. Um, my talking to um, an expert forester out at Harvard Forest uh, praised us for how much we're treating because no one else in Massachusetts or in the Northeast are thinking about this. But in the coming years, especially by 2040, um, our climate is going to be more like the mid-Atlantic, where the woolly adelgid is rampant, um, and they have not been able to, to find a control for it down there. So this is, even with this, this is... I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, Ten years ago, the prediction was that it would be moving much quicker than it has. And uh, again, I, I, I'm wondering if you've had a chance to look at the Shadowbrook Glen hemlock stand, which is quite substantial. Uh, and, um, and actually, a dozen years ago, I, I used to observe a lot more of the fuzzy sort of balls than I do now, because they seem to have built in a resistance. And I'm wondering well, if you're familiar with that. Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, I'm familiar with the forest. I'm not familiar with how they handled the woolly adelgid. Um, 
but I am familiar with the forest. Yeah. Okay. Tom, um, a, a couple of things I would just add. One, we had a fairly scientific, not fairly, we had an uh, extensive scientific evaluation of the trees based on both the crown size, which is at the top of the hemlock, you know, the, uh, the leafy uh, you know, branches, but also the, uh, the um, lack of the individual leaves on each stem. And uh, that's how the rating was evaluated from uh, poor, fair to good. I would also add that um, there's really uh, uh, four things that are threatening the hemlocks at Ice Glen. One is drought, and I, I don't believe because it's such a, I believe because it's such a steep incline that uh, when, and when we had drought conditions for that past two or three years, that that really, uh, it, it, it made it that much harder to keep the rain where it needed to be because uh, uh, trees with enough water have better defenses than they otherwise might. And obviously last winter, last summer we had uh, uh, more rain event. Um, the other thing is that there are, there's actually a third pest which usually hemlocks are able to um, defend themselves against, which is the native lupin caterpillar. And so, but when you take drought conditions for several years and you take uh, the two invasive pests plus this new pest and you add them all together, and what we have is a rec uh, an evaluation by not one but three different forestry experts, including the most renowned old forest expert in the world uh, on hemlocks, uh, yeah, Bob Leverett, who gave them three years and pointed to Purgatory Gulch and what happened there as exactly what's going to happen here if we don't intervene. And the reason why the project went up in price so much is because we don't want to, we don't want to spray, basil spray the bark with all this pesticide in that forest. So we basically increased the budget by about two and a half times and we're only injecting the trees. So the only thing that consumes this pesticide uh, is the bugs eating the leaves because the entire life cycle of the pesticide till it breaks down is inside the tree. Um, and for folks who are worried about porcupines eating hemlock leaves, these leaves are 200 feet up and I don't think uh, porcupines uh, climb to get the old growth <laughs> leaves. So, you know, we're, we're trying really hard to balance a lot, but you know, at the end of the day, you want to roll the dice and potentially see them all die off, like happened at Purgatory Castle. So, uh, who would be applying the pesticides? Uh, it, it, it's right. above 10,000, so it has to be bid. And they will, of course, be licensed uh, applicators. And in this case, it's a special specialty because they have to be able to inject them. Yeah, right now we do have an RFP that will be going out at the end of February which we had the time correctly with the spring and the trees waking up and making sure that they could hold the price for us for the a lot amount of time so that it would all line up that they could go out there and do it. Um, and this one thing I will add too is that we are treating for both um, elongated scale and um, the woolly adelgid. Um, so the, what we chose will treat for both. Um, and as Patrick said, it will be injected um, and since that raised the price, we were only able to treat half of the trees that are in poor condition um, in the Glen. And just on the money side, um, we have applied for a USDA grant and an MVP grant to assist with this effort. Unfortunately, by before the 11th, we won't hear whether we were successful with those grant applications in either case. So. Our worst case scenario is we don't get any grants and we try to figure out whether it's from CPC only or a combination of CPC and the town warrant article, how we how we go it along. But we have, we've been working really hard to try to bring in partners uh, to uh, help fund this effort because, you know, it's it's uh, it's very expensive and it's a small town. So, uh, Patrick, I just have a protocol question for you. Uh, since you're part of this application and you talk about we, are you going to be recusing yourself when we vote on this application? I say we is in the town. Pardon? It's we is in the town. This is the town's plan. This is Michael Canals' plan and the agriculture. But you didn't region. answer my question. Uh, look, at if you want me to check with Donna before we vote, I, if you want me to check with town council before we vote as to whether I need to recuse, well, I'm just, it's every just single thing on my list, and there's about 10 of them, is something I've been involved in, but, you know. Okay, uh, yeah. I just want to keep things. Yeah, I don't have any personal interest in the in the trees other than I like ice climbing. Probably not. 
Well, uh, that can be true of just about every application here. We don't have personal financial interests, but okay. Thank you. Patrick, oh, tell I'm me happy again, to check though. Tell me again um, who the you, the potential grants are from. There's the MVP and what was for a grant from the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, uh, and we also applied for a grant from the Municipal Vulnerabilities Program, which is the climate grants. And, uh, and, and, and they are, the MVP grants have a talking session to review the, it's called an early expression of interest, which we submitted. And so we should get some feedback as to what they're thinking is sometime in the next week or so. Okay. Cool. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. See ya. Hi, uh, my name is Anthony Elsberts. Um, I'm the curator at the Stockbridge Library Museum and Archives. Hi. Thank you for the opportunity to come over. I'm next door, so I get to do a face to face. I haven't done it in a while, so glad to be here. Uh, I'm applying, uh, I'd like to apply for a very small amount compared to some of the projects that I've seen. We are, um, I'd like to look at getting a new uh, display that can hang on the wall for an object that's in the museum and archives. It's a piece pipe that was gifted to the Stockbridge Library and Archives by the Stockbridge Muncie community in 2006. We have it, it's fine, but the case that it came in is not an archival case. It's fine. Everybody, you know, if you were just an everyday person, that's fine. But I'd like to be able to bring it out and hang it somewhere in the library where we have good uh, archival quality glass and we have a, a quality to it that would preserve the piece. So, for example, you probably know UV can really impact an object. So when you go into a museum or someplace, a lot of times there's light controls and things. You don't have that. So I'd like to propose that we uh, apply for about two thousand dollars. This is I talked with the Williamstown Conservation Center of the Williamstown, and they they ballparked that. They've been pretty good about it. Obviously, when I would submit the application, I'll write it down. Um, and that that would be the, the project we'd like to pursue. I'd like to be able to bring it out into the more public space of the library and have a narrative that goes with it, so that it's not tucked away. So that's essentially the, the request. Okay, sounds like a reasonable request to me. Yep, sounds good. Okay, thank you. All right, thank thanks, Sophia. Matt, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Matt. And Matt, I just want to thank your whole committee, Agriculture and Forestry. You're new and you hit the ground running and You've really been working hard, and well, we appreciate you. it. Thank you. Well, we've had great help along the way with Pastor Nick and Jeff, so it's been fun. Okay, thank you all. good. Thank you. All right. Since came up first on the list on my computer over here, where to go? Um, There's a view that can show everybody on it. Oh, I hate it when you do that. Do we have to do that? Oh, because people may be raising their hands. Mm. There you oh. go. You got it. Oh, no, no, no. That's good. I thought you were going to put this up. I okay. Oh, the screen share? Um, that screen share. Now, we're not seeing the uh, video. Well, that's their... No, I the, think... Uh, they and have to turn on the their... They have to turn on video. That's yeah. up to them. That's up to them. It's not us. Okay. We right. can't so anything about the list that I made has Jane Ralph from Construct first. So you're up. Need to unmute. There yes, I just did that. Great. I'm going to ask June Wolf to join me. She's our housing director. I am our yep. executive director. And I think uh, June's worked with you a bit more than I have. Um, so want to thank you for past support. And uh, June, I think, is going to take the lead on our request this year. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having us. Uh, so we um, own Pinewoods Apartments. And as you know, um, last year, we came to you for $70,000 to put toward the driveway. 
unfortunately, it never stopped raining uh, the whole year. So um, we were either, it was either raining or flooded. So we um, were not able to do anything um, last year, but that's okay because that was a uh, preliminary work, which we can do uh, at the same time as, as the rest of the driveway work. So this year we're going to be asking you for another $70,000 toward the driveway. The total budget for that driveway is 220,000. And then we had hoped to uh, do a feasibility study to see if we can fit more housing on the land where Pine Woods is. And we will need $25,000 to do that. Um, we'll have to do an engineering study, um, you know, because of the soil and uh, which, you know, that came up when we first built it. So we would need to look at that. Um, and then the last thing is that um, our boilers are aging out on the property. And so we, um, we have been trying to replace them, but um, our capital reserves are going mostly toward the driveway. And so we're looking for $12,000 to replace one of the boilers. In June, do you have any other boilers that you feel are about to fail? Because uh, when a boiler fails, it takes a unit off, off the market and people can't live in it. So it really has a big impact for a relatively small number. I'm just wondering, you know, uh, they all were put in at the same time and you got, uh, you know, X amount of units, what, 32 units. So I'm just wondering if there are any others you've identified. Yeah, good question. We have 30 units and we have the um, central building, which has a furnace. Um, furnaces tend to last longer than the boilers. And what's happening is that the, um, the, the boilers are becoming obsolete. The parts are impossible to get. And so that's why we are um, ending up replacing them. Now, one thing we're doing that, that's uh, you know working better is we used to have a wall hung boiler and a hot water tank, and now we're doing combination units. So um, overall, we'll be saving money uh, in the long run, but um, you're right. They were all put in at the same time and we have replaced uh, three of them. So we have 27 left to go. We have one that's urgent and then there'll be 26 more um, following up. Yeah, and if I can jump in, I think I think our goal is to get those replaced as soon as possible for the reasons that were, were suggested. Um, we recognize that that may be, on the, may be beyond the scope of what the CPA can do. So we're looking at multiple, uh, multiple sources for those funds. And, and do you have a sense of what the maintenance cost has been, let's say over the last three years annually for the aging boilers and water heaters? Like what is the amount of savings when you put a new one in, you presume you're not gonna have as much maintenance expense? Right, so a heat exchanger, which is the, um, it's the, basically the guts of the boiler, uh, to change that out is about $4,000. So, you know, it keeps coming up that um, we can replace parts if we can get them or we have to replace the whole thing. And so for years, we would replace the parts. Um, and now that's becoming impossible because the parts are very hard to get. So June, June Jay Bykovsky, I have a, a quick question for you. On the boiler repair, the boiler repair is necessary for you, uh, for, for, for us, to be able to rent one of the apartments. Is, will that completely put that apartment online for rental? Uh, yes. It's replacement. Thank you. Otherwise, the apartments are in good shape. You know, we, um, we've been maintaining them all along, and um, we've replaced uh, carpet with uh, engineered flooring as often as we could uh, because it's more durable and um, in the long run, it's less expensive. Uh, and we, you know, we've been taking care of them the whole time, but, um, you know, it's the things that, at that wear out that, you know, like the boilers. So um, I'm Tom Stokes and I was on the original Community Preservation Committee Board when uh, the project was first uh, 
built and it was our major project for several years. Mm -hmm. We're really pleased that uh, Pinewoods remains a vibrant and important part of the community. Uh, but I am curious, as it seems like for these units to be old and already out of service, it seems that in some ways that they should have lasted longer. And I'm wondering if it's, were they defective or why, why are they antiquated in less than 30 years? It just seems. So um, I'm, I'm going to just channel uh, my husband for a minute who designs heating systems. And um, I think that that was a mistake that Construct made when Pinewoods was built. And that was before my time. I came on shortly after that. Um, they made the mistake of predicting that boilers would last 30 years, which is what um, old oil fired, um, you know, those dinosaur boilers used to do. Extremely energy inefficient, but they would last a very long time. These boilers are are much more efficient. Um, you know, they're they're over 90 percent efficient um, propane fired wall hung boilers, but they they run on computers. And so a computer that was um, hung on a wall in 2005, uh, you know, you wouldn't keep a laptop that long. So um, I think that that was an erroneous prediction that these boilers would last 30 years. I think that's part of the problem. And they're not, um, you know, the, the heat exchangers are made out of aluminum now you are right, Tom. In in one sense, um, when when I first started in two thousand and seven, so this is only a year after the the property was put online, I was having an incredible amount of of uh, calls about the boilers, and so I got the manufacturer's rep to come in and look them over, and what he saw was that um, when they were installed, um, the they were they were filled with antifreeze, a hundred percent antifreeze. So when you when you have a boiler like this, like a computerized boiler, um, there's a there's a mix that you should do with the um, for the heat exchanger. And so they actually chewed through the heat exchangers, and that's one of the reasons that we exchange so many. But once we put in a new heat exchanger, they should have they should last twelve years, and that's they've done better than that. Um, they've lasted. 16 years now. Is that right? Andrew, how many, um, let's talk about the heat exchanges, changers, just for one second. Um, would it make any sense to try to buy three or four of them as kind of a triage move? You know, like, you know, and sort of have them on, on site. So if you could find one, maybe you can find five. And that gives the boilers a couple extra years because 26 times 12,000 is what around Three hundred thousand dollars to replace them all. And I'm just wondering if, you know, if you if you have a fair amount of history that they tend to fail. I mean, how many of the exchanger cha exchangers haven't been replaced? Do you know? Um. So, uh, yeah, about seventeen of them. And so we we have done that. Um, we stocked up on parts when we realized that these were becoming obsolete. Um, and that's another plus for my husband. He he is in the industry, so he was able to to um, source a lot of parts for us. But even he can't do it anymore. Uh, okay. They're just not they're just not making. I mean, they're making better boilers, so that's good. Uh, but um, yeah, they're obsolete. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a question back on the driveways. Uh, you said the total budget was 220 and uh, of that CPA funds this year and next year, I mean, last year and this coming year, total 140. Is that correct? That's right. You're getting 80 from other sources. What are the other sources? Um, so we do have some reserve funds. Um, there were, we have um, about $124,000 left. So we'll use some of that. Um, and that's what we've been using on the, um, you know, on the boilers so far. Um, but, you know, uh, we don't want to use it all. And then um, we're going to be, um, we'll probably be asking for some ARPA funds as well 
and then you know we're we're always looking at sources always there's a there was a were you on the conference yesterday with uh, the delegation on housing yeah i was i was so i'm definitely looking into some of those sources that were that were presented and this next round of of um infrastructure mm -hmm. I think asking for $300,000 worth of boilers from one of those groups is a really good idea. <laughs> Just uh, another the, question. The money's flowing now, so yeah. <laughs> In terms of the units that, uh, the rental units, uh, how many are market rate and how many are subsidized for? Um, so great question. Um, I'm, I'm gonna change your terminology a little bit. Five of Thank them are market you. rate. Five 20. of them. Yeah. Our market rate. 25 of them are um, or were low income housing tax credit. That's um, that program is sunsetting. Those 25 units are also um, they have um, funds that came in from the Department of Housing and Community Development and the Federal Home Loan Bank. The Federal Home Loan Bank has now sunsetted as well. And then um, they uh, Sorry, the subsidized units, there's actually five um, project based voucher units. So those are units that actually have a subsidy attached. So, how is the funding going to happen for the 20 that's the balance? Um, I'm just going to keep applying and looking. <laughs> I mean, again, ARPA funds, I think, are, are our hope, but we're, we're putting in applications in a number of places. Okay. And they have reserves. And we, we feed the you know reserves every year, so we won't completely deplete them. And in terms of your expansion thoughts, uh, how many how many units do you say you're hoping to? Well, the idea is that um, you know, like I said, the the twenty five units are LIHTC units, low income housing tax credit, which is a great program. It's very successful. And um, it really works for the tenants. So um, we would have loved to re-up with them and do another round. But between the time when we built Pinewoods and now, uh, they've gotten it's gotten a lot more competitive, that program. And so what happens now is there's um, a minimum of 45 units to be feasible. So we thought if we were able to add 15 units um, and turn the five market units into LIHTC units that we might be able to, to put in for the LIHTC program again. And that would carry us another 15 years. Um, it, you know, and it might get us some other capital needs that will come about in those years like roofs and you know, appliances, things like that. June, um, it, it's Jay again. Do you do, have you looked at a preliminary site expansion site for this project? Um, even, even before you do the feasibility study, do you have any ideas? I'm thinking it would have to go up. Yeah. I don't. I mean, you know, I, I started in this field as the property manager at Pinewoods and. I've walked the property many, many times and uh, immediately outside the perimeter of the units, you hit wetlands. Yeah. And so um, I remember when we put in the uh, community garden, uh, we had to, um, we added soil because um, the, the soil <laughs> was so bad. And so we ended up having to, um, uh, replicate elsewhere on the property uh, for the Conservation Commission. So I think, I mean, it's tight. It's very tight. And, and Jay, that's why the 25, it actually includes an evaluation uh, of, of our zoning for the purposes of, of uh, what would be required unless they went with a 40B, which is a different type of permitting process. Yeah, the, the, only, the only concern that I have is would there be potential displacement of people if you're talking about uh, uh, an elevated structure. Okay. That's so a um, question. 
Right, that's a very great question. And so um, we we always have to do something called a relocation plan. If we work on any property that's already inhabited, then we have to submit a relocation plan to DHCD. So um, we would submit it to you as well. And so, in other words, we have to we have to keep everybody housed. Thank you. Just tell me how many units you have now. Thirty. Okay, and you want to get to 45? Right. Why do I- want I to at least explore the feasibility of it. I understand. <laughs> what, what made me think that the magic number was 50? That's not right. I probably misstated it. <laughs> that was your fault? I think it was it, if if <laughs> we kept right. the five market rate units, I believe it would be. Um, is that right. correct? Because we have to have yes. 45 that are right. LIHTC eligible. Right. So, and I don't know how hard it is to switch uh, market rate units to LIHTC units. Um, so uh, that may be where that came from. Okay. Thank you. I remember the construction originally and the plans and the how we squeezed everything into square inch that we could. Right. Um, it is dicey for wetlands. Um, I, I agree. So so I think that going up is probably your only option. Well, and that's why we need the engineering study because um, as I recall, I, I read all of the um, construction notes from, uh, from the process. And as I recall, the soil density um, was tested more than once. I think it was tested and that's why all the buildings are on piers um, it was tested and I think there was actually a math error. And so then when they tested again, they realized that it wouldn't hold. And so they raised all the buildings up. So then if you add height to that, you're adding weight to that. So, so it would, we'd have to look at the existing, um, structures, supports and see if that could hold it. It's also flood storage. Right. It was flood storage that had them on pier because otherwise you have to do compensatory storage, which you had to do for the garden right? Um, because the whole project is in the floodplain. Right. But at some point you get pounded down to rock. I mean, people in this town do it all the time. <laughs> I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm just saying that that was the reason that it, they were on piers was because of the flood storage issue. Right. So oh, um, I have one other question about pine woods in general. Uh, years ago, there was a study done and a project that was never completed uh, on creating a walkway, which would largely have been an elevated walkway that would connect to uh, provide a, a walkway from pine woods uh, into the town and other people wanted to go the other direction to the four corners of the botanical garden. I, I think if I understand that question, there is a water table issue, water table, you know, elevated water. As a result, uh, the state has uh, issued some concerns about that walkway that would go from pine woods down toward uh, uh, down to a town, if you will. And I'm wondering how we get the state to react to that, June. There were so, a lot of issues with um, that. Yeah, I'm glad I've been here forever uh, because many, many, many years ago, Jess Toro um, with the Land Trust uh, pulled together some meetings of interested parties. Now, Pinewoods, as I understand it, um, we uh, put all the land that we didn't build on into um, into an easement, uh, you know, a protection easement. So, um, you know, we own it, but we don't, you know, uh, we can't build on it. So, so um, just uh, had a few meetings and we had some engineers at the meetings. And as you say, when you leave Pinewoods in either direction, you're in the wetlands, you're either, you're either in the Larry Wog area, or if, you know, you're going toward town, there's that uh, depression that comes right off the road by the um, by the water treatment, and so the the plan was to um, 
come in from the, you know, the overfull parking for the garden and to put a trail that would go by Pine Woods and we could connect to it and it would continue past the water treatment until it daylighted at, um, I'm forgetting, the Grange. Is that the Grange? Mm -hmm. Yes. The they Grange. have the Thursday yeah. night dinners. Yeah, um, haven't been there in a while, sorry. So um, that was, a, I thought that was a nice plan, but um, you know, every time the engineers opened their mouths, you could hear cash registers. It was, um, it was really going to be prohibitively expensive. And then, and then the meeting stopped, and I don't know what happened it, with that. It um, was it was because of the expense they had um, they had contracted with um, the trail builder, whose name is gone temporarily. Um, I'm sorry. Was it Peter Jensen? Peter Jensen. Yes, it was Peter Jensen. Yes, I think he was at the and meeting. He, yeah. And he talked about he talked about doing a floating bridge over mm -hmm. over the oh. um, brook. And that was technically difficult because when it floods in the so in the spring, then the bridge had to be able to survive that flood. And also on the east side of the transfer station is the bird sanctuary. And the bird sanctuary is very um, restrictive in terms of what anybody could do with it. And there, it, it just became, um, it became an albatross. It was just huge. And it was the, the, um, the obstacles were insurmountable at the time. So right now it's on hold. Um, I, I'm, what I'm hearing, I'm, I'm curious, does it make any sense for us to relook at this issue vis-a-vis uh, -vis the feas a feasibility study? So yeah. today I had a conversation with Michael about this issue and about looking at it with a fresh palette in terms of where where trail might go you know behind it or whether we could add a sidewalk or you know move the guardrails to a sidewalk where we want to base i want to uh, my colleagues have weighed in yet because the arpa hasn't been on the agenda yet but uh, but michael and i are talking about uh getting some engineering support for this specific project out of our op arpa allotment so we can finally come up with a plan and then figure out how to fund it once the plan is done. But that, but that should be something that these folks put into their budget for CPC support, you know, to do a, an engineering study to get some funding for a study for that project. The, the idea was to use ARPA funds for the engineering study. At least that was my idea. To use That's what? To Michael about. ARPA. So we don't need any ARPA. Uh, yeah, we don't. We want to figure out a way to safely let people. We got people in wheelchairs there. That's to exactly safely correct. Allow people to get from right. Pinewoods to town. And right. I don't want to. I don't want to pre-imagine as someone who has a hard enough time shoveling his driveway what the solution should be. I want to have a professional expert come in, give us some options, give us the costs, basically do a twenty-five to seventy-five percent engineering plan, and then the town can decide whether uh, we want to do it, and if so, what resources we need to bring to bear ourselves or we might be able to find, you know, externally. So we're comfortable saying that the town will look at that aspect, right? Yeah, I mean, okay. Yeah, I, I, I just want to be sure. I, I think it's really important that that not be an oasis of housing that is kind of, you know, buttressed by a wetland on one side and, uh, and a 50 mile an hour highway on the other. So I think figuring this out should be a high priority personally. It's a legitimate issue. Well, thank you for the update. And they have that. they have enough um, issues of their own without yep. adding that to it. I think. Well, <laughs> yeah, we've got our hands full. <laughs> um, I mean, that would be a wonderful benefit for Pine Woods, I'm sure. But I think you know, boilers are kind of top of the line. And I want to remind everybody, um, we have two hundred nineteen thousand dollars, roughly, coming from the town. If we're matched 100%, that's 400,000 for this year, but we don't know that's gonna happen. Um, so, you know, I go back to my horse and pony um, speech about how if you're asking for a horse, you may get a pony. Um, so just be, everybody should be prepared. All right, Karen Marshall. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next on my list. Need to unmute. I am not speaking. I'm not bringing anything to the CPC. 
Oh, okay. You're just listening. You're just uh, listening. Yes, I'm just listening. <laughs> okay, fine. I want to learn. I want to learn the process because at some point I will be coming before the CPC. Okay. Well, then you don't have to talk. Okay. Good. Oh, well, then, and welcome to you know to listen. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Hey Fletcher, I know you have is you have things that you want to bring before us. Kate? Hey everyone, this is Kate Fletcher from the Fountain Committee. We are working on the restoration of the cat and dog fountain and the watering trough. And I think Tom, you're gonna to recuse, right? Uh, I will that's I would recuse myself from voting on this. I, I don't necessarily recuse myself from any discussion. Okay, usually when we recuse, we recuse from the very beginning, but that's, I'll leave that up to you guys. Um, so, so basically, um, the, I, I sent in my re report to everybody on the committee. So you have that um, with an update for last year. Um, we are, the, what we're looking at right now, well, we started looking at it last year, was the basin. And we, we always knew that the basin was sort of a question mark because um, we just didn't know what we would find until we were able to get down underneath the basin. So I'm going to share out my screen if I can. Steve, are you there? I don't think he is. Okay, that's all right. I can just grab oh, yeah. it. Yes, I am. I just opened okay. it for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. So basically, um, what we found um, last spring, once the cat and dog had been removed to, um, to Jeff's studio for restoration in February, then in the spring, we were able to dig down a little bit at the side of the basin to see what we were dealing with. We knew um, that the basin was cracked and we had hoped that we could do a repair to that and, and use a seal. But once we, we dug down and took a look, um, it turns out that the support underneath the basin is crumbling and completely degraded brick that dates from the installation of the, um, of the, uh, of the fountain. So, we are working on our costs for, for what will be involved there. And that is, is really the focus right now of our uh, application. We are hoping that we will be able to do some work in house. Well, we know we'll be able to do some work in house and we're hoping that we'll be able to cover the work with most of the work, at least with what we have remaining from last year's grant, but we need to be, we, you know, we want to be certain that we will have enough. So we really want this project to wind up being such that that basin is, is set for the next hundred years and um, everything is, is, is good to go and, and we'll be long gone before anybody has to worry about it again, but that's our goal. And um, so we, we are looking on addressing that basin right now. Okay, Kate, what's, who's, what does in-house mean? So on the application, you ask about um, you know, what other funds are available. So in-house would be town, town staff. And then Mike Canales, by the way, has given us a lot of his support and time. He helped us with the whole RFP process. Um, you know, as the chief procurement officer for the town, extraordinarily helpful. Really, at a certain point, we knew we could not move forward with this project without the support of the town. And we've gotten wonderful support from Mike Canales. So uh, Mike, as well as Mike Buffoni, and then um, potentially Hugh Page to pour, you know, to help out with the foundation that the basin needs to be supported Okay, so what we will need is to have some sort of a concrete support underneath the basin. And then the basin itself needs to be, and that's what will be done in house. But the basin itself needs to be done by somebody else. Okay, that's, I was just wondering. 
Yeah, and then we're also, last year we did fundraising and um, I was able to raise some funds. And this year I'm actually working on that right now. So I have, I have a nibble and um, seeing what I can do to, to bring that, reel that nibble in. And you will, you will expect to have some more um, definitive uh, numbers for us when the I'm working, on, I'm working on, yeah, we're working on it right now. Okay, cool. Because we will need some, at least a pretty definite ballpark. Well, the application's due on the 11th, right? Yes. Yeah. And oh, we're also, the bottom tier is also the focus of, of what we're looking at as well. So that's that's part of the, there are, there are a lot of moving parts here and that's that's one of them as well. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Questions, anybody? Nope. Okay, thank you, Kate. You're welcome, thank you. All right, so next on my list is Pat Flynn. Pat? You gotta unmute. Hi. There you go. I must apologize in advance. Some of the planning that I wanted to do for this was interrupted by, by a, a fall that I had last Sunday when I broke my left kneecap and my right pinky. <laughs> oh, bummer. I, I'm, I'm learning what the right pinky does that I never knew that it did before <laughs> and that I can't use it for. So at any rate. Well, thank you. Um, I'm here on behalf of Laurel Hill Association, and uh, we would like to have a project um, for the Upper Bacchus Woods. And I'm going to share, see if I can do this. Um, Steve, we have screen, screen share. Yeah. Yes, it's so it's open. It's on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Yes, but you I have did, to have your I document open first on your desktop. Oh, well, I have I have it. Uh, okay. Can you see? No. No. Uh, I can see it. <laughs> Pat, if you want, you can email it to my town email address and I'll share it for you. And we can go on to someone else and then come back to you now in the next one. All okay, right. well, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Um, sure. So, so who do I email it to? To pwhite at townofstockbridge.com. Not Stockbridge dash. No, 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 mine works. The old one works. Okay. Um, so say that again. I'm sorry. My, my brain P. White. is wrong. White, like the color. P white yeah. at P white I at town of stockbridge.com. Okay. 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 So, all right. So, and then we'll call that. Uh, Shelby, did you have something other than the trees? Because you're next on my list. I don't see him. No, I think he already did his thing. Okay. Um, Stockbridge Housing Authority. Yeah. Andrea? Um, here I come. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, last year, we created a project, um, the Heaton Court Siding Board Replacement Project. And I asked for 34,000, which you approved for fiscal year 22. At that time, I also put in um, for fiscal year 23, 33,529 to complete that project. And that's what I'm going to be submitting for this year. Um, I just wanted to mention that because um, 
we have received the CPA fundings. I was eligible to apply for high lap funding, um, high level asset protection, and they did match me $2.50 per dollar that you allowed me, um, which has been huge. And we threw some of our formula funding in there and I feel like we're gonna be able to do all of our, our siding issues. Oh, that's exciting. With this. So I'm what's just, the total for the school year? Yeah, what's, yeah. So this, for this year, year is 33,529. Which, which they had on their application for last year. Yes. So this was, this was a two part, but we have, to, we have to go to town meeting to get it approved, mm -hmm. even though they, it, was, it was a two year project. I understand that. Okay. Here's the part I never understand. Is that money already set aside? No. Or is that money coming out this year? Comes out this year. Okay, so it's not just that we're going for approval, we're a warning at this Yes. Point. So here was my always, always question. Why did we tell them to put it on last year? Just because it gives us something to think about. You know, we've, we've um, it, it tells us what they're planning. Yeah. It gives us a sense of what's coming up. Um, it's, it tells us that um, it's an ongoing project. And I think it usually gives them I don't know, preference is the right word, but because it's already been looked Definitely. at and it's been reviewed by town council and all of those things, it's sort of streamlined at that at this point. Okay, I understand that. And you didn't do it just to confuse me for the last five years. No, I tried. I know. Well, I, I tried really it hard. It worked. No. It was good. Should I, I'm going to submit again. Is that correct? Uh, yes. right? Yeah, right. you can just basically change the dates and just pop it in. The same so, thing. Because yeah. that, okay. that thing Sally just explained, because that exactly what you wrote last year has been reviewed. Yeah, okay. it's been reviewed by town council. It's been reviewed by, um, I guess it's affordable housing, so it doesn't have to get reviewed by. Um, so I'm very impressed Stark. with the 2.5 match. Uh, have we? That yeah, that's that's fabulous. Um, yes, I was very excited about that award. We did the application. So in total, with the money that you awarded us um, last year and hopefully again this year, my formula funding and their match, we have like $306,000 to take care of these buildings. That's fabulous. It is um, and, awesome. that's, and that'll go for the siding and all that? Yep, your funding um, only, I think we'll cover the cement board replacement, but all the other funding will help us with the, the painting and everything else we need for the outside of the buildings. Can you um, document that, Andrea? Um, Somehow in your application, just say, you know, we received this match, because it's one of the yep. things we um, that we look at is is how what we what we give which is you know in some cases not a whole lot um but how it can leverage other funding and and that's really important i think for the for the citizens to understand that this is you know that that it isn't just the money that comes from us but that that other organizations look at this money that we've um that we've recommended and 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 I mean, two and a half times is really pretty amazing. It's wonderful. So I think you were on our call with a, when we were discussing the heating systems at Pine Woods. And it occurs to me that uh, that heat and court has been around longer than Pine Woods, quite a bit longer. And yet your heating system is all pretty good, is it? Um, well, I've only been here since 2019. And the boilers that we have now, I, I'm not unsure when they were replaced or if they were replaced, um, but we did a big repair in building G um, yeah. on a boiler. And some of them are requiring a lot of maintenance. Um, when I first started, they wanted to do a project to re start replacing them. And then the state declined it. 
Um, so we're limping along. I could get more information on that, but how long they've been here, the ones we have now. I'm just curious. I think maybe one of the reasons your boilers have lasted a little longer is they're older. perhaps because they were older and not so dependent on this fancy computer technology. Could that well, be? Yeah, what we have now, we have some of those with the fancy, fancy computer technology. Okay. We've done, we've done a lot of upgrading it heat and cooling over the have, years. Yeah. yeah, so so they've got new fire protection and and they had issues with all kinds of stuff. Um, uh, you know, they had mold in the walls and that was a big that was a big one. Their uh, you know their funding they have level they have funding that's that's um, from the state is they only get so much. So if they if they can't get money from somewhere else they're out of luck. Oh, well, one of okay. the reasons that Stockbridge rates one of the best in the county in terms of affordable housing is because we have both pine woods and heat and cores. So yeah. I, I do think uh, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful uh, organization. Thank you, Andrea. Well, All right, thank you. Yes, right. Pat, you're back up. Yeah, Pat. There. She might be muted. It's my opinion that she's on the phone. Hi, Pat. I it shared. Pat, I'm I, I'm sending another one. Okay, because okay. we've got we've got your picture. Um, yeah, up on our screen. I'm I'm just about to send another one. Do you want um, me to take this one down, or you're going to talk through this one? Okay, I I just sent the other one. Whoops. Do you want me to put that one up instead? No, there, there are two of them. Oh, okay. Well, I'm just asking which one you want to start with. Uh, start with the second one. I was, well, this one, that one's fine. Okay. Okay, so what's up? Okay. Um, Upper Baptist Woods, we have not... Laurel Hill has not paid any attention to that property in the 40 years that I've been on the board. And one of my bucket list things before I leave the board is to, to do something about Upper Bowker's Woods. We had a forest management plan and the next um, slide that I sent uh, is actually the plan. And if you'll go to page 21 of it. Right, one second. Um, that that should yeah. really be the one we look at first. Pat, before we move this one, see the bench? Yeah. Okay, that's the bench that Peary and I put up for Edgar. Is that in good shape? No, this is Upper Bowker's Woods. This is not Lower Bowker's Woods. This is Cinderella Pond across from the Norman Rockwell Museum entrance. Oh, that's not across from, um, okay. We went and looked at that last year, Pat. Right, right. Conservation. Yep. Yep. I that think was the, that was just a little informal look at. So if you go to the next to the last page on this. Uh, this one I just put up? Yep. She wants you to go all the way okay. down. Yes. And you're going to have to rotate it. All right, good luck with that. This is my answer. <laughs> See if there's a way to do that. Not, not that one. Not that one. Oh, that's good. Page 21. Nope, no. not that one. That one there. Back that's up a page. There, there we go. Can you make it a little smaller so that you can? Pat, your wish is my command. <laughs> yeah, if I could only figure out how to do, I didn't, when the share came up, I was looking for desktop and I didn't see desktop. But at any rate, um, that's the Upper Backers Woods property and um, the, it's basically between the pond, Cinderella's Pond is basically almost halfway between Butler Road and the Norman Rockwell Museum entrance. And as you'll note on this map, you'll see the 
long trail that goes sort of along the woodlands, uh, wetlands there. And that's part of the old sort of logging trail that went all the way over to um, Mohawk Lake Road. Yes, that. And because this property used to go all the way over to Mohawk Lake Road and it was sold off. We acquired this property in 1941 from R.R. Bowker, who was one of the co-founders of the American Library Association. And his home was at the junction of 183 and Mohawk Lake Road, that beautiful house that the goodies have renovated. Um, there has never been an official trail over to the bench. And the bench that you see in the little black box next to the pond is it's so overgrown and everything that you really can't tell what's going on. So we would like to put that short trail from 183 over to the um, over to the bench and have some parking there just off of 183. If you go over to the other exhibit, uh, the other slide. The other slide that I sent, you'll see that better. All right, I'm looking for that. Okay, we have to also keep in mind that this little pond is a vernal pool. Yes, and there are the protected salamanders, and it's a whole wetlands area, so we're going to yeah. have to go for uh, a notice of intent it's, to do the whole project. It's kind of a big deal. Um, yes. the, Jeff yes, the, the Jefferson salamanders um, breed there. They go across the road to the um, little pond on the Rockwell property. Yeah. And get squished a lot. Yes, by yes. It, it, yes we realize it, it restricts um, it restricts the uh, time period that we can do work in because it we have to do our thing after the salamanders do their thing in the spring. We should do a tiny culvert there. Yes, we should. Yes, that, was, that, that was where I was going next. We, we've been um, talking about the, the uh, across or under Glendale Road doing the, the little salamander culvert with little salamander signs, you know, this way. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, but, no, it's true because they do have salamander crossing signs, yes. and I—I I mean that this is my this is my I'm I'm representing the conservation commission on this yes. board. Yeah. Um, if we permit your plan, I think that there's going to be some give and take about this um, in terms of protecting the salamanders one way or yes. the other, whether it's putting a uh, you know, a, a salamander crossing and or signs and or <laughs> um, something to also to make sure that the people who are coming to enjoy looking at the vernal pool understand what a vernal pool is. And um, yes, I that's, have, that's part of the, the application that we're going to do is we want to have the short trail, um, which is only 100 feet long, actually. Um, and some parking and signs, because we want to have one of our new Laurel Hill property signs, the pretty leaf signs, um, but we don't, we can't put anything up until we have a accommodation for parking and the trails. And uh, that would include an interpretive sign, which would in, uh, include all the information about the salamanders and the, uh, and the whole wetlands area. Um, so there's a guy, there's a guy whose name is Matt Byrne, and he's from one of the high schools in the eastern end of the state, and I can't remember which one, but he does a whole program on vernal pools, he did uh -huh. one, he did one at the Rockwell Museum, must have been 10 years ago, maybe as many as 15 years ago. So he, he has actually been there. I have the slides and all that stuff downstairs in the conservation office. You might be interested in that. Oh, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Hey, Sally? Yeah. What do you think? The, the time that we're crossing the road is what? It's in uh, March or April, isn't it? 
it's usually the worst possible night you can imagine to be standing out in the middle of the road because it's usually just around 30 degrees. We'll go wrong with it's you. almost always raining or snowing or sleeting or doing something disgusting. And you can stand out. I have a picture of my... I see the date. I just, well, it varies. I know, but what's the range of days? I would say mid-March to okay, so beginning of April. I would suggest if we do this project, it's closed for the month of March with a gate. I have a picture of my son on the from the Boston Globe being out in the middle of the road doing this. I mean, Pat, what would you think of that if we kind of like keep people away from the migrating endangered species for a few weeks in March? Well, you'll have to. Would that have to close the trail down? In the park. Oh, I don't think so. Okay. Because we want people to be engaged in this. I mean, we want okay. them to understand that these critters are crossing the street and that. I mean, it's just so easy to get to the Cinderella Pond if you can park there. I, I would think it's not to me, but you know, I think the safest way to protect the habitat during migration is to just keep just suggest to people it's like open 50 weeks a year, but this two weeks uh, we're kind of you know prioritizing salamander. But that's just my opinion. And we can have people park on Butler Road too, because we yeah, actually yeah. own that property on Butler Road all the way down to the river. Um, we own five acres there. That was uh, given to us by the Rockwell Museum when they first opened. Lila Burley was the president of the board and she was very interested in getting Laurel Hill to have that, that property on Butler Road. They but, also uh, they also cross at night. Okay. So about yeah. Okay. It would What's be an it budget? would be an it'd be an opportunity to um, expose people to this so that they would be able you know if we say okay they're going to be running on such and such a night, um, <laughs> but at any rate if you go back to that other um, the, the 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 other slide. Oh sure. Uh, <laughs> The one with the, okay. Yeah, the one at the next to last page of the forest management plan. It's interesting that the Jefferson salamander is probably the least attractive of all the salamanders. Let's, uh, let's also just make sure that we're not encouraging um, pet stores in Florida to like collect this endangered species. <laughs> yeah, it's the same one you had up before. That's what she asked for. But we, we also want to um, reopen the, the old trail, which is pretty much closed up and go all the way, if possible, around the wetlands area and come back out. Um, the Greenagers have, have scoped out. We still need to do a delineation around the, the wetlands um, so that the whole project, um, it looks like the monies that we would need would be between 20 and maybe $24,000 altogether. That does not include the notice of intent, um, but that, that would include the short trail parking and there are a couple of options for parking because that is a uh, not a good corner bend and you can't see the cars coming from the north along 183 um, so that planning is probably going to have some something to say about that the location of the parking it's possible to put in a maybe um, depending on how close we are to the to Cinderella's pond to put in a, a circular, not a, a half circle parking so that you enter and exit um, in, in, a, you know, in a half circle. So there'd be one entrance and one exit because the, the most important thing is that people will not be able to back out onto 183. We want to make sure that they, you know, they head out so that they can see traffic coming. So all of this has to be you know, worked out. So oh, in your planning, in your planning, you want to be planning any sort of parking or anything like that has to be at least, at very least, 100 feet from the wetland and the pond. Yes, right. Yes, we're aware of that. That's why okay. 
the curved may not be a possibility. So okay. it would be nice if it could. But we're definitely, have to have, we're definitely going to have to have signs that say, you know, do not back out onto 183. And Pat, what's your estimate of the total project cost? Um, well, we've gotten some et estimates from the green agers and stuff. And um, from what I can tell, it looks like it's, I would say, you know, in the $24,000 range. So are you coming to CPC for 100%? Um, well, we, there's a possibility of uh, an AARP access grant and a uh, Department of Agriculture grant too. So we have to look into that. And I'm, I'm sorry, I, <laughs> being laid up this week, it has not been, CPC has not been my top priority. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, um, how much of that we can depend on, I don't know, the, the Department of Agriculture. But we have gotten notice about the uh, availability of access grants from the AARP. They're interested in projects that promote access. And this is perfect from the standpoint that it's all level. There's no, you know, there are no hills involved here. And if the, and the trail that we want to be all chipped, once that gets trodden down and packed, um, it would be more accessible to wheelchairs, but in, in the beginning, it probably won't be. But from the standpoint that people will be able to walk and not hike up, that would help. And it would be wonderful to be able to do partnership with the Rockwell to you know, invite people. If we have the town put in a crosswalk from their entrance over to the, to the park, you know, people can come and have lunch, sit at the bench. And because the pond is really lovely. And, you know, for these 40 years I've been on the board seeing this lovely little site just get totally neglected. It's been sad. So that's my hope. Okay. Do you have any questions for me? Anybody else have questions? No. Thank you. All set. Okay. Thanks, Pat. You're welcome. We'll look forward. All right, next on my list, Patty Kaya, is that right? <coughs> Hi. Um, well, I don't have a presentation. Um, I'm actually here because I mentioned something to Patrick and to the Park Rec Committee, and Patrick said I should come to the meeting. So I'm not, as, <laughs> I'm, past and I'm not as familiar as to this is actually the appropriate forum, um, but there's a there's a high demand for the kayak racks at the town beach um, and it's a demand that every year there's a high demand and people get left out. Um, there's a demand for the kayaks racks to actually be a little bit more appropriately sized for the water vessels that people seem to store on them. So basically what I think we need is we need a few more racks and we also need the racks to be a more of, of a sustainable variety of sizes. So the ones we have now are very appropriate for paddle boards, one or two, or for a single kayak. And I've spoken to um, to someone in the town of Monterey where they also have public racks that are in high demand and in good use. And um, he said that there are kayak racks that are available that are a bit wider so that you can fit a canoe and they would actually stay on the rack or you could fit two kayaks, which seems to be a very popular configuration. So I don't know if this is the right committee or if this is the right forum to be here to say, is there a, an appropriation process within the town to help out the park rec committee so that we could maybe increase the rack availability to at least come closer to the demand that we have each year. And also um, to make the racks more available to people who are um, older or maybe not quite as mobile because we have so many spots that are very, very high. So there's just sort of a better configuration of racks that is possible to um, take advantage of this great amenity that we have in the town beach, the access to the lake and people's ability to use recreational um, quiet water boats and kayaks, paddle boards, whatever you like. Um, so I don't know if this committee could contribute to the park recs 
Um, I'm going to talk about it. It's on okay. the list of town projects that I'm going to um, go over when it's my turn. I will. Did you happen to get from the Monterey guys what the cost per rack was of the ones they were talking about? No. So I, I so back then I didn't know. Um, I didn't. I was just calling because I wanted to. It was when I first bought a house in Stockbridge, and I wanted to know how other towns managed the process of the racks. So that's what actually why I went to Monterey to find out. I went to all the towns that had any sort of beachfront, and I did my research. So I can go back. I'm happy to go back to Monterey and ask them if they have some more up-to-date pricing. Because what happened in Monterey was when the racks became very popular, they just got more to meet the demand. It was a very, like, very relaxed system. So I'm happy to check in, and I'll let you know if I can find out any additional information. Okay. This is something that we could um, potentially fund because we have a recreational component in our, um, our way of doing things. Um, so yes, uh, I would think that a kayak rack would be something we could fund, but we would have to have more specific yeah, we, numbers. We, we actually have a plan. That, okay, um, we have a plan. But do you want to let, and is there anyone else from the public that needs to I, Well, Ann Rabinowitz is from on Parks and Recreation. Ann, do you have any? No, she's not. She's not. No, she's not. She's on, she's on housing. Oh, I, I housing, and she's, right. she's on our committee. Yep, yep, yep. I stand yeah. corrected. Thank you. So, yes, we're there, okay. Patrick. Well, I, first, I just want to emphasize, Patty, that while we have many ideas around um, Parks and Recreation, all of us do, that we do have an elected Parks and Recreation Board. And so uh, some of the projects that we've been um, coming up with today that I'm about to talk about uh, I have talked with members of Parks and Recreation, with Steve Knopp uh, and Michael Canales, but at the end of the day, uh, doing things like replacing racks will be their decision because they're elected representatives and, you know, uh, nobody in this room has authority to decide other than them, like, you know, how, how and, uh, and, and what priorities they have. That said, I did get approval for the projects I'm about to talk about. So the first one, um, I'm going to just share this screen. Hold on one second. Patrick, is this on behalf of the town? That you're so all the town projects, including some that we've already talked about, I just typed them all up so that it was one place to evaluate town projects. Share screen. Hold on. Okay. So Not open sure. space and recreation, parks and rec. Um, uh, one of the members uh, expressed an interest in senior exercise equipment. Um, uh, Michael Canales feels like uh, that, that uh, due to the being in the floodplain over on Park Street and questions of type of equipment, scale, where to locate it, how to protect it from floods, that he would like to start with engineering and then uh, evaluate whether, uh, whether there's a good place for it and then you know uh, price out what it would cost. So uh, one project of theirs is senior exercise equipment. Now, as I go down these projects, um, okay, where does projects, the senior exercise equipment go? What? Where does it go? I believe they want to put it on Park Street, but it's not. Yeah. What? So is it a gym? We're talking yeah, like build out equipment. You know, like kind of outdoor workout equipment. Yeah. So is it's it on. It's outdoors. Yeah. Over by the like skate ramp, I think you know. Okay. Area, you know, All right. I would just area, I wasn't make a little senior area. I would like to see our see our ramp that we paid for all that money for go back in the this kayak. Is the, the sun is tonic. Yes. Well, why don't you look at the list because uh, that is okay. coming up. Okay. So okay. So nice for that. So the first talking. thing is, I just want to emphasize that 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 um many, if not most, of these projects, uh, because there are a number of them, we're thinking that we would do. Uh, a partial ask here, partial ask with uh, with the warrant, and maybe if if we can do something with ARPA funds, we haven't really figured out the finance yet. But because this this deadline is first, we're going to need to sort of um, you know uh, understand uh, you know uh, we, I just want to share with you the entire budget that we think. 
So that budget is 15,000. How we split it up, I'm not quite sure. We should know by February 11. So, Patrick, when you say we, you're talking about the board of. Talk about the town, the, Michael Canals, and the and and the uh, and uh, the board town of town administration. The town of the, you, which is responsible for the board of selectmen, then. Yes, absolutely. And we reviewed this list with with uh, at the board of selectmen meeting on Thursday. This is on our agenda. Um, because we wanted to come in, and I didn't, I didn't want to speak for my board, so we had a we had a discussion of what projects that the board wanted to see. Um, but we're not the CPC, and we're not Parks and Rec, so these are just suggestions. All right, we're not you know dictating, obviously. So the beachfront renovation we talked about is is removal of the invasive plants, including the Phragmites. Um, the plan uh, from the engineer. This has already been engineered is to replace it with Jonai weed, which attracts butterflies, and red twig dogwood. Um, in addition to add some erosion control uh, measures, uh, dispose of the Phragmites in a way that doesn't spread them, and create a path down to the water for the boats. Now, the sense was that that project, we actually got a quote today on that. It was 15,000. Uh, Michael and I put in another 5,000 to address the question of the dock, I mean, not the dock, the racks. Um, uh, and I just want to, you know, emphasize that we did that just so that, you know, we knew it was going to come up, but really we're going to need between now and February 11th to work with Parks and Rec and, and finalize what their ass is going to be. Finally, at the, at the Housatonic kayak ramp, um, because of the varying levels of water there, there's no safe way to return the ramp. Um, to that location. So instead, what they want to do is they want to do what they do in Egremont and Monterey or in the, up in North Adams or something, where they put stones in the water and they basically create a way to walk out safely uh, without walking in muck. It, it's, a, it's something that's done in two other locations. Michael Canals knows where they are. I don't, I've never been there. But um, the idea is to basically take stones and, and lay them down where that current ramp is on the Houstonic. And we believe with the engineering as well as the movement of the stones, and we have lots of stones because we're fixing a lot of bridges. So the idea is to you know, recycle some of the stones from the various bridges, put them where that ramp was, and create a stone walkout area similar to how they have in other communities. And what happens to the ramp, which was thirty thousand dollars, as I recall? Uh, yeah. eBay? I don't know. Um, you know, it could also be used at the beach, for example, or even at the boat ramp. Who knows? It just doesn't really work for the river. Yeah, I'm just, you know, yeah. I just hate to see. We paid for that. Oh, yeah, we did. See? Oh, yeah, we did. Yeah. Well, you know, right. I went down the river and then it's it got. It's pretty cheap, so I'll make sure that we figure it out or sell it. Um, well, it seems as though, I mean, I think they have all, they've recovered all the pieces of it. And it was, last time I heard, it was sitting at the highway garage. Yeah. It would certainly be nice to use it since it was town money and all that. Well, but this, in terms of kayak ramps, the uh, the uh, some folks over at the boat ramp who use the boat ramp, both the fishermen and the the recreational kayakers, because uh, because um, gravel goes down the paved uh, driveway into the water, yeah, you know, where it's still paved, it's actually quite slippery there. So one of the priorities that we're also working on, and not coming to CPC for, is to figure out a way to have kayak launches that are safer down at the boat ramp. I don't know if this would be appropriate for it because I'm not an expert at kayak launches. Um, and the other idea is possibly to just use this at the end of the path on the beach, you know, so people could basically launch their boats using something like this, you know, right at, at the edge of the beach. But I don't know, once again, I don't think it's been worked Just, out. Just my own opinion of having been down there a lot for the 25 years that we ran the canoe races, um, there's a considerable amount of erosion that goes on between the Williams place and the and the boat ramp, where the kayakers walk up and down the bank, and it's and it's also the Josh Billings, and um, so I would think that having a uh, a ramp there where it would um, help to yeah. alleviate the the erosion would be something that would be worth considering. But having said that, there are a bunch of really old and substantial trees there that you would hate to see. 
get comprehensive. And the state owns yeah, the boat ramp. So we're working with the state to try to come up with a plan for both the trees and the parking lot and the kayak launches and even potentially a dock. But, you know, uh, they've had a lot of turnover at the DEP, whoever deals with this stuff, or DCR, whichever one it is. DCR, and I we're think. We're working on it the best we can, but it's been hard to sort of get traction there. But anyway, we're thinking about it. All right. Um, okay, so moving on. Uh, Campusa, um, Jess feels strongly that uh, with all of the water events of last summer, it, it, uh, beavers are optimistic. They kind of moved in as it started to flood. Uh, it is, it is, uh, Campusa is becoming very much like Ice Glen in that they think that uh, uh, Jess and the NHESP are concerned that, that, um, that it won't be able to handle the stresses that it faces. Those stresses are salt, those stresses are uh, very high levels of water, significantly higher than they traditionally were. And uh, the third one is um, is invasives. So there's a plan on the invasives. I believe NHESP is planning on burning off the phragmites and you know uh, revealing the you know the seeds underneath. Um, uh, there was a plan on salt. We're investigating whether or not that plan is still in place because it was from like 10 or 15 years ago. They bought a special piece of equipment. Uh, the state did, and for this. Uh, we uh, we strongly feel that we need a hydrology study that uh, would uh, really evaluate what eventually we need to do to keep the water level so they don't basically drown the thing. Now, having said that, we um, we believe there might be uh, funds available from NHESP. They they this is the only calcareous basin fund in the entire state of Massachusetts, and as such, it is a. Uh, uh, area of critical environmental concern. Uh, the state folks have have uh, very much an interest in and a passion for protecting it. And we also applied for an MVP grant uh, to not only do this uh, this hydrology hydrology study, but also to do some education around Campus Abog and do all the things that MVP requires, like community outreach and whatever. The thing with those is they're very competitive, so one may not know on MVP, certainly won't know by the time this is in there. My guess is that uh, if we're gonna do the study, a good portion of it will have to be a warrant item. Uh, and then, you know, maybe coupled with some kind of grant from this. There was, there's been a fair amount of study that's happened on Campusa. I was on the stewardship committee for, I don't know how long until Judy Spencer died, I guess, pretty much. Yep. And uh, as that yes, stewardship sir. committee no longer exists? It, yeah, we're reviving it. It doesn't. You're what? We're going to revive it. So um, the, I know that the folks from UMass did a lot of work down there. They're still monitoring devices in the brook off of Rattlesnake. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that monitors, but I went by the other day and there was somebody going down with a UMass truck. So I think that they're still involved. I would certainly reach out to them and find out what they're... I mean, the problem with this, Sally, is there's like 17 organizations with a stake in... But they've been at it for I understand, 15 but years. You need someone like Judy Spencer, who was the czar right. of Campusa exactly. and coordinated all the various stakeholders and the scientists and... Right folks and landowners and and it's like it's a pretty significant volunteer job that we're going to have to recruit someone to do i um, but, understand but right now you know what's it's really what's really clear just from the water levels where they used to be versus where they are now that there's just a tremendous amount of beaver activity even upstream uh i mean you know and and, and downstream and and uh and that in addition to these water events with climate change you expect these more severe storms and you know. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely a problem. So uh, I will have I will have that better defined as to what that project looks like. There's actually a grant we already submitted for MVP. I'll make sure everyone gets a copy of that. Um, the Gold Meadows guys already came in. The Agriculture and Forestry Commission guys came in. We can take off the trail work uh, that uh, was uh, talked about at the meeting because they decided not to apply for that. Is that the trail work from um, pot, from the Grange to the... Um, no, this no, is the this agriculture forestry, the trail work to kind of clear the big down trees across the trails of Ice Glen. Yeah. I don't know how they're going to do it. They will do it, Tom Money. Then the last page is um, historic and housing. Um, uh, uh, at the select board meeting, uh, I was asked to submit a plan for this, uh, for sort of a 
um, a historical education project that would include um, uh, markers that you could scan the QR codes for and, and then have a story come up that was specific to that area or that grave or whatever. So, you know, it's basically both physical physical items like markers and, and, and interpretive signs, along with uh, a website with possibly an audio component to tell the story of Stockton. And, uh, and the idea is uh, to um, start off with a, uh, some money coming from the town and some money coming from CPC. Now, the, the um, Muncie, the Stockbridge Muncie folks did that a couple years ago and it was not allowed. So we would have to make sure that we talk to town council as to what- What was not allowed? The project. The project for a walking- um, The walking trail. Trail. Right, with, it doesn't fit. Yeah, it, it didn't, they it didn't apply. So we, you need, I would check with, I would check with them. Let us cross that. I'm, I'm just telling you this was. Yeah, a just no. I but I would check with town council as to what what's allowable. Because um, town council said, uh-uh. Okay. All right. Well, we can do that. Um, and, uh, and also can be that you know that. Uh, uh, but I, I'm happy to call Don. Sure. Um, Cat dog found Kate already went over, and the, the last one on historic is, uh, we we've, we've uh, had an evaluation of the Glendale Firehouse. It needs to be renovated with, uh, you know, architecturally appropriate windows, you know, uh, repairing and, uh, and updating, you know, the woodwork, the whole nine yards. It's a $75,000 project and, uh, and we wanted to ask for 30, for half of that from the CPC. And then the final thing is basically Jay's. Jay's, you want to cover that one? Oh, the housing trust fund. Well, the, uh, the only point on the, on the housing is that we're in the process of developing a uh, housing trust fund declaration right now uh, that'll have to be approved by the uh, select board. And subsequent to that, uh, then we will start to develop specific projects. One of them is Pine Woods. You heard about what they're doing. And this funding would also uh, start to deal with other projects that come down, come down the road. There were a number of them uh, uh, where we're talking about uh, <clears throat> a number of uh, properties uh, that are uh, in uh, have tax liens, and that may be part of that to establish some of those properties for housing. So that's that's where we're coming from. I'm I I love the the idea of pine woods growing. You have to build a fund. I know, but do you think they can go up like that? What, what, I'm sorry? Carol? Pinewood, to get more units at Pinewood. Yes, absolutely. I think it's going to be, I'm very supportive of that. But do you think that it's feasible that they go up? Yeah. Because they're on stilts. And, and that's why. Well, they're they're trying and, to and, they and, stop and, them, and, Oh, okay. And your point is your sister aboard. Uh, your point is very well taken that yeah. pine woods is something we want to build on. Absolutely. I mean, that's part of rock. Yeah. Did you ever think about or consider um, the building on or or or, or, or enlarging Eaton Hall? No, Eaton not at this point. What what do you say Eaton. now? Eaton. Eaton Court, you mean? Heat yes. Heat and court. Yeah. yeah. Not 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 yet. Pine Woods is first. They have, one. Prop, they have some land, Heat yeah. Court. Eaton Court. Eaton Court has some land that I know. I'm still living in the nineteenth century. It was Eaton Hall. I think it's important to recognize that uh, you know, that we can dream of fifty projects and never get them done, or we can tackle <laughs> five projects and do them exceptionally well. And I think that the feeling in both with Town Hall and I believe my board is that we're going to prioritize these projects, stage them out over three to five years. And certainly like Heaton Court is an excellent example of something that there's a need for. We just can't do 20 or 30 of these. Right, no, I get it. I just wondered, you know. So um, Jay, this, um, your housing trust fund declaration will include the Pinewoods project potentially? Well, she's going to make a submission. Right, but yes. I mean that—that's part of your. That's, that's not coming out of thing. Uh, yeah. 
Pinewoods, Pinewoods is applied to CPC, and then they might apply to the housing trust under ARPA. I understand. I'm just I'm just asking if that's a component of your yeah. thinking in the yeah. last. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Good question, Sally. Because I think it's great. Yeah, yeah. I do too. I just think it's good. And I would love it's to. Important. See, I would love to see another property developed with the same kind of of components and of having the fair market because you know we're still dealing with the fact that we don't have police living in town. Our fire department's getting older. You know, I I, I don't want to say that I don't want some of those guys trying to carry me out of a two-story house. I'm glad I'm moving into a one-story house, but still, the fact is that we're not going to be sustainable at this rate if we don't get younger people in town. Well, some I've even heard that some folks are suggesting maybe people have a two-family where they can rent one side. Well, who knows how you afford this town at this point? But uh, I will say that with my tongue in my cheek. Um, okay. All right. Excuse me. Do we have anybody else out there? I think I think, I think we did it. Everybody. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Steve. For sure, John. Second. Four of six. Uh -huh. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Is that right, 545? Is that clock right? Yeah, thank you, June.